a Teams translator or a Skype's translator, you're using artificial intelligence and you're using machine learning behind the covers, learning how you speak and how you use language. If you use PowerPoint, you actually have Azure Machine Learning um, with design ideas. And if anybody's ever used PowerPoint recently, you throw pictures on the slide like Garrett and I, those pictures look really good of our families. We didn't actually make that organized. We just said design, make it happen automatically for us. It was using machine learning services under the covers for us. Now we have two versions of machine learning service. So Garrett, I got to ask you a question. I don't want to throw you under the bus. Are you a data scientist? I am absolutely not a data scientist, Matt. Nor am I, and most likely you're not either. Now, there are two ways we can use this. We have the Azure Machine Learning Service. Those are for our data scientists, for people who really need to get into the math behind this. They can develop, track, train, make their own modules, uh, make their own models to work with it. And then there's the other one, Machine Learning Studio. Notice the bottom line here, Garrett, no need to write code, all right? That's us. It's a really great way to build and test these solutions. I would imagine, although I don't know for certain, um, with the rhinoceroses, they probably mocked something up in the machine learning so just to see if it could work. And then they did the real work inside the machine learning service that we have. For your exams, know the differences between the two uh, that we have no code in the studio, learning services for our data scientists, uh, scientists and the mathematical engineers that we have. A Couple other things, we have serverless computing inside of Azure. Serverless computing, we have three uh, areas we can focus in, that's Azure Functions. Um, how do I describe functions? A function is normally an event that's triggered by something, and it's one event comes in and one event comes out. Um, it'll create infrastructure under the covers for us automatically. Normally, they're HTTP triggered events. They don't have to be, but essentially, hey, I, I create something and spin up a website. One point comes in, one point comes out for us to do and leverage it. We also have logic apps. Logic apps are another way that we can start in Azure. Now a point comes in, but I need to make decision on that. I actually need to make a decision. Is that a, a picture of a poacher? Is that a picture of a, uh, of a rhinoceros? Or is that a picture of uh, wind moving? When you need to make decisions on data that comes in, you're going to use a logic app to go through that workflow, that actual structure to, hey, I need to do this, that, and the other. Then we also have event grid, where we have a single point come in and we want multiple things. It's just a routing service. Now think about this. Um, think about the poacher example for a moment. They get a picture of a poacher. What has to happen? We most likely, well that function will come in. The picture came in there, that function might have cleaned up that picture. Maybe cropped it, maybe sent it along, but then sends it off to a logic app that says, or sends it off to machine learning service. The machine learning service analyzes and says, hey look, that's a picture of a poacher. Sends it to a logic app. The logic app looks on that, makes a decision, hey this is a poacher. Then it sends it to event grid. And event grid says, okay, that's a picture of the poacher. First event, I'm going to send it off to be stored and safe and secured so I can have capture that information. Second event, I'm going to send it down to the people that are trying to go catch the poachers to get in a helicopter to go find the poacher and save the rhinoceros, possibly catch the poacher. The point about these, and it calls serverless computing because under the covers, there's machines that are running all of this information. They work in conjunction depending on what you want to do. Um, I know in the rhinoceros scenario, they do a lot of functions to go through that routing, uh, go through that uh, process of making sure they try to catch a poacher. Some really cool stuff that's there. We also have DevOps services built into Azure. DevOps services um, used to be the old Visual Studio team services. And what that is, it's the ability um, to collaborate and work with code. When you have a group of developers working together, it's not too similar than, uh, dissimilar than people when they work together on a Word document for a common proposal or something along the lines. The difference is the type of material that they're working with. With developers, they're working with common code. And so we have to treat that a little differently. So when we want that collaboration with developers, we're going to use the DevOps services to give that, where we can use the Kanban boards, get repositories, where we can do some load testing. We have some pipeline capabilities here. We can really get a good look at how those developers work together. We're going to use DevOps services. We also have DevTest Labs, another service for developers. And what DevTest Labs allows us to do is actually go in and, and uh, give developers a basically a proof of concept creation environment where they can actually go create and work with things at a lower cost. Now they're locked down, that comes with the caveat, oh, guess what? We have to use those resources in a local fashion. We have to use them in a controlled fashion, not in a production uh, environment. We also have the Azure App Service. This is probably the biggest thing from a development standpoint inside of Azure. Where do develops, uh, developers live in Azure? They live in the app services. And you know, well, what kind of apps do I make? Well, it depends on what they're trying to do, but our, our web apps are there, our mobile apps, any other service that we're going to use, it's designed to run on our platforms. This is squarely in the platform as a service environment. As a matter of fact, a lot of our 
uh, software as a service offerings in the marketplace, they started as an app service. A vendor simply came along, I want to make something that does things, and it's going to work inside the app service for its use. The last thing I want to talk about in this module is our management tools. So I led off with the portal on how to create things inside of Azure. That's just one of a few tools that we can use and leverage on how we get things done. And I'm going to give you a quick tour um, and we'll wrap up module two here in just a moment. So the Azure management tools, it starts with this structure. Remember the Azure Resource Manager or ARM for short. And by the way, our templates are commonly known as ARM templates. Why? Because whenever you do anything, whenever you create something inside of Azure, it goes through the resource manager to get that work done under the covers and the subscriptions. So the first thing we have to do against ARM is we have to authenticate into the ARM, prove who we are, and then we can do our job. And what are the tools we have? We have the portal. That's what I did to create the virtual machine, the storage accounts. That's what I went into uh, to work with inside of it. We also have the ability to leverage what is called Azure PowerShell. This will run on your local laptops and your clients. It can be a Windows system, a Linux system, or a Mac system to run those environments. If it has Mac, you have to have the .NET Core, but it allows us on our local systems to tell Azure to go do stuff, manage stuff, create things, work with it. We also have other tools. We have the Azure CLI or the command line interface. This runs on top of a Windows, Linux, or Mac system on Bash or on top of PowerShell. It's another way we can work with Azure to manage and maintain that. We also have what is called the Cloud Shell. The Cloud Shell is in the portal. As a matter of fact, I brought it up. I didn't show it to you. It was there for us to use. In other words, I don't have to have the stuff loaded locally on my laptop. I can open Azure and get to the Cloud Shell. And I can open that up and run commands, whether they're PowerShell or Bash, or I can use a CLI. We also have an application. So if you go to your app stores, um, you can download the Azure app for another mobile experience to work with it. Now folks, the reason I show you this, re regardless of what tool you're going to be able to get into, and, and I don't, if you have a, a Mac laptop, a Linux laptop, or a Windows laptop, well guess what? You can use any management tool. Any of them are open to games. What if you have an Android tablet? Well, you can't load tools on it, so you can't use Azure PowerShell locally, but you do have access to the portal, which means you do have access to the cloud shell. So pretty much everything we have, we can access the cloud shell. Or what if you have a phone? There's an app. Now that app is generally a monitoring app, but guess what the app also has? Cloud shell. Why do I tell you that? Because in the cloud shell, guess what? It's a browser environment with an editor that you can actually store and have a central repository for your scripts. Now let me show you uh, the cloud shell real quick, and then we'll hop out of module two. So I'm going to hop into my portal here real quick and I'm going to hop in my home area. Now inside of here, how do I get to my cloud shell? It's up here, this cute little icon. I, I, I know it's the PowerShell icon and some people it's a square with, I don't know, a greater than sign and an underscore. I, I don't know. I always think like a, it's a duck sticking out its tongue. Um, however you want to look. I don't know. There's lots of things you can use here for it. It's this icon. Just know this is the cloud shell. I'm going to bring the cloud shell up and it's going to bring up my cloud shell. Um, it brings a, a bash up, which was my last one I went inside of it. Now, I don't know anything about bash. Uh, it's ba I know what it stands for. It stands for born again shell, which is a Linux environment. But what I do know is inside of here how to bring up what is called the Azure command line interface where I can interact with Azure. And I'm just going to type in the letters AZ in my shell and hit enter. And it actually will bring up all the different commands. Now, I also, I always chuckle at get this gear. I think this is a long lost art form, the bit art, like being able to type letters that are there. But notice I have CLI and it gives me the information of what I can do. Now, how do I learn more about this? So I just want to give you a little bit of information uh, here. So I'm going to learn more about this command called group. Group is how we manage resource groups uh, with the CLI. And I'm just going to put az group slash slash help. And it's going to actually bring up that information for me. It gives me the help. Well, I need to know more about this. Well, I can hit the up arrow. I have command remembrance like we do with most uh, command line tools that we have but I'm going to put in az group and I'm going to type in the word create. That's one of the commands. I want to create a group with uh, the command line interface inside of here at enter. And it shows me an example, the different variables I can put inside of it. Folks, the point I want to make is that when you're going to use CLI, every command begins with the letters az. And depending on what you want to work in, how you, can you find out more help? Dash dash help at the end or tick tick help at the end, you can work with it. Now, if you're wondering, hey Matt, which tool do I want to use when I get into uh, the Azure environments? Really, I recommend learning CLI. Um, and for your exams, you're going to want to know CLI, but you also want to learn Azure PowerShell. So to do that, let me switch over to my PowerShell environment. Now folks, I'm not bragging, I've done a lot of work with PowerShell. I have a couple books on PowerShell, a Linda course and things like that. 
But I don't tell you that for that because I actually like CLI a little bit better and you're gonna see why. Now PowerShell we still need because it's not, CLI is not quite fully uh, full feature yet. But let me go ahead and just clear my screen out and let me type in every CLI command begins with what letters? AZ. AZ, so I'm just gonna type in AZ, hit enter. And notice I get the same bit art, I get the same command structure. So folks, the reason I like CLI, I don't care if you have PowerShell or Bash, you can interact with Azure at the same command syntax. Same exact command I typed in Bash is the same exact command I type in PowerShell. It's one of the huge advantages of learning uh, the Bash or, or learning the CLI environment. Now, the last thing I want to show you here real quick is if you want to learn about Azure inside of here, if you want to learn more about Azure, first off, what can you do? Um, in any Azure, uh, in any PowerShell, I should say, want to learn more about PowerShell here, type in git command and there'll be a test on this. Everybody got that? Okay, those are all the PowerShell commands that I can run, uh, Azure PowerShell commands that I can uh, use inside of it. Now, unlike CLI, where I put the help at the end, if you want to learn more about PowerShell, a certain command, you can type in git help. And I know one of the commands uh, that I could use to resize or work with a VM is called update azvm. These are all called commandlets, git help. Commandlets are in kind of that verb noun uh, relationship. Um, git, set, start, restart, delete, followed by a noun, whatever you're trying to do, whatever object you're trying to manipulate. And so if I just say git help update AZVM, it actually has built in help for me to use and leverage. I can even have some switches like, hey, I want to have an example so I know what this looks like. Just type in examples and it gives me that command line interface. Folks, I want you to understand that the tools are there for, the, for this particular exam, know the differences and just a little bit about the tools. In real life, learn how to automate it. Uh, Garrett talked about the importance of leverage in the different types of technologies for repeatability. Templates are one way. Learning how to create scripts and modify and work with these scripts becomes another way that we can be consistent and repeatable with Azure. So from that standpoint, folks, you really want to learn how to use these languages. Now, if you're kind of like a free agent, you never really used any in the past, I'd recommend learning two. Learn the CLI. Learn how to use the CLI, how to find help, and then learn how to use PowerShell. If you only want to learn this because you're never ever going to real life because you're going to take the exam, learn PowerShell and learn CLI. You're going to see both of these examples in pretty much every exam you take from here on till forever with Microsoft. That's where we focus in that. Now I mentioned with the exams past AZ900, you might have labs that'll give you tasks. We don't care how you get the task done. If you want to use a GUI, use a GUI. If you want to use uh, Azure PowerShell, if you want to use CLI, you use whatever tool you're comfortable with. So in our exams, we don't really care which tool as long as you know how to do the task. So with that, that brings us to the end of module two, where we talked about a lot of the core services. Once again, an inch deep, but a mile wide. We started with virtual, we started with the physical architectural availability zones and availability sets. We focused on virtual machines, networking and storage. And then we spent a time talking about all the other types of solutions that we can run in Azure. Thank you for your time and your attendance today. Today we covered module one, where we discussed cloud concepts and module two, where we learned about the core Azure services. Join us tomorrow where we will cover module three and discuss security, privacy, compliance, and trust. And then we'll finish the day out covering module four on Azure pricing and support.